Hello and welcome to The Smartest Moron, where we're fi- Enough of that. We don't have time for your long-winded self-introductions. Okay, um, well, you heard the man. We might as well continue. Go. The frame for our story is set in a war between three sides. There is the Federation, a collection of countries united that will not factor into the plot of this story. Ever. Like, I, all I remember from the first game is like one little bit and that was it. Then there is the Empire, more of a dominant force that started this mess in the quest for more power. Finally, there is Gallia the tiniest independent nation that is somehow staving off the Empire. This is due to a resource they have that the Empire wants, Ragnite, which can help in creating more effective weaponry. Just ask the tanks that blew mine up. Needless to say, Gallia can put up a decent offense, but the sheer numbers are going to be too much, especially when the Empire is using someone like Salvaria, who I already stated in another video could blow up tanks with ease. Around this time in the story, Squad 7 is being formed and is around to aid the war. So there's a spoiler right there as to how this war will end. But after this long-ass summary, we eventually cut to a young soldier named Kurt, who is proving his worth as not just a soldier, but as a commander as he guides his troops to victory, and with no casualties either. This impresses some of his squad mates, one man even turning into a major ass-kisser. That might as well be the guy's name as I don't even remember it. Right away, Kurt does give the impression of a professional, reminding me a bit of Sosuke Sagara of Full Metal Panic, just without the over-the-top comedy with his seriousness, although now I want to see these two interact. But of course, things go wrong when he delivers a letter to someone rather high up, who was betraying his own country, and fearful Kurt read the letter. Overreacting to the simple possibility, he manages to set Kurt up to a one-way trip to the Nameless. You can basically think of the Nameless as the Suicide Squad. And for those that are trying to suppress the bad memories of that movie, basically the Nameless are made up of criminals that form into a penal squad, whose actions are not recorded in history. This is reflected with how they have to refer to one another by number, they are expendable and often thrown the hardest missions to make it easier for the Gallia military. Refuse and, well, you get executed. This actually does help show a much darker side of Gallia, making them a bit more morally gray, but we'll see more reasons in a bit. Although let's be fair here, a story about them will be far more interesting than the actual Suicide Squad movie. When Kirk gets to the squad, he doesn't really have the warmest of receptions. No kidding. In fact, earlier in the game, he did spot the Nameless as Rila was mourning the loss of their captain. Speaking of which, surely Rila could give him a warm welcome? I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Look, my password is Cat Loves Food, yeah, yeah, yeah. My freaking brother's name is Martha. Just please don't kill me. <laughs> okay, it doesn't end like that. But it does help show how Kurt isn't exactly in a setting he expects to be in. In fact, things grow considerably worse as the squad doesn't even come with him on missions, not willing to trust their lives to some new captain, or even Gallia. It's understandable though since those in the Nameless are kind of like Kurt, in that they were thrown in here for weak reasons. Well, most of them. There are some that do legitimately belong in here, like Cedric, an actual murderer, or Giselle who has some, let's just say, hot ideas. I've got it! Arson! Then, of course, there's just pure racism. For those unaware, dark sins like Gusurg and Imkar are usually hated by people. We didn't see much of it in Gallia in Game 1 outside of Rosie in the first game, who did eventually get over it as the game progressed. Oh, and then, of course, there was a whole Empire mining thing and then setting it on fire, but I'm getting way too deep into that. Here, though, yeah, we do see armies not only abandoning dark sins to die, but even throw people into the Nameless when they just want to join the military and defend Gallia like every other citizen. It's ultimately up to Kurt with the aid of the only person the group trusts, Gusurg, to convince the squad to follow him, lest they all end up with a bullet to the head for disobeying orders. And the path is not made any easier as there is not only the likes of Zalvaria that make them worry, but also the Empire's own version of the Nameless called Calamity Raven. Although this one is a bit more racist, as they are all dark since they are given the option of join the team, do some mining with no benefits, or die. Though at the very least, the leader of Calamity Raven is passionate about his race and is aiming for independence. From there, the plot has more complications due to the war, like traitors, breaking rules of war, and situations the characters are not fully prepared for that require delving into spoilers. And surprisingly, it's handled well. Mostly. There are still some problems like not every character contributing to the plot that much. This is easily noticeable with characters like Shin who join later, but never get into the conversations. There are apparently extra scenarios that do this, but as far as I know, these are not translated, barring the epilogues. 
they do at least have extra missions that, when you get the character to kill enough people or participate in the fight, will unlock and give more story on them. At the end of those missions, a new potential will be unlocked or even change. Another problem with the soldiers is that, well, a lot of them will chime into a conversation with not much to say. I mean, sometimes they get it right, but rather than conversation, sometimes it feels more like they are giving their thoughts to the situation or randomly chiming in. It's not really something that bothered me too much, though. They can be more involved in the plot than, say, random extras in the first game. Plus, with how long the story is, they could have trimmed some of the fat off of it. I mean, once I said 60 hours, I go over 100. I swear to God, it's a miracle I got any videos after doing all this crap. Uh, now if only that miracle can work for the job market. Now, as per an overall theme to the game, it's definitely outcast. No question there. Our main heroes and villains resemble that well given how their uniforms are far different from both Gallia and the Empire. They are people neither side cares about if they die, sent in to do impossible feats, and if they do die, meh, whatever. They are trash and impure to the perfect society both sides seem to envision. Darkson's already represent this well, as we see a ton of them mistreated. Even a soldier from another country, Shin, is forced into the Nameless just because he's a foreigner. They are treated no different from regular criminals. Hell, Imka herself is an outcast among even Darksons, given she doesn't care about Darkson lifestyle that much, and is so hell-bent on revenge, something no Darkson wants. There is another theme, but we'll cover that in the spoilers. And given the nature of the Nameless, this does also allow Gallia to deal in some, well, dubious activities. They are also sent in to break war laws such as disguising as civilians or even the use of chemical weapons as seen with not just in this game, but against Salvaria during her DLC mission and the Nameless could just take the fall for that, too. Nobody likes taking these orders, least of all Kurt, but he has to obey and figure out a plan to go around such dark needs or impossible odds so his squad doesn't die. Neither side is painted in a good light with all these actions. Now, some may say this creates a plot hole in Game 1, but not really. Isara couldn't join the Nameless due to being with Welkin, who was the son of a war hero, and Squad 7 was managed by someone who wasn't a moron or a racist. The only other Darkson I remember joining besides another tank pilot was Lin, who only comes so her lover isn't killed. And even then, she has to be unlocked to be used. At that point in the war, I don't think Galia would be too picky given how much their asses were getting kicked. And again, Squad 7 is filled with good folk. The other squads? Not likely. This is bolstered as we see other squads in the game that are, well, pretty much assholes. Although occasionally there are positive depictions of soldiers, as we see in some cameos. But then we have the other moments to help us see why Kurt wants to keep fighting. There are people like Squad 7, who were the main heroes in the original game. There are civilians doing their best and doing everything to help the Nameless, like the future heroes of the second game. Or there are even regular soldiers within Gallia who gladly work alongside the Nameless. And that's because they have a goal, to protect their home. The balance between the positive and negative aspects with these two countries does help in humanizing them more, not wholly embracing one side or the other. Although the Empire, of course, does come off as the worst of the two. No doubt, and Borgia is honestly only a tad better than Maximilian due to how he manipulates to how and created some of these events. The whole religion angle he was going with didn't really have a strong presence in the story. Really, he feels more like a plot device than an actual major villain, although he still leagues better than Barthandalus. Thankfully, the rest of the cast does pick up the slack and carries the game's plot quite easily. With all that said, let's dive into some spoilers. <laughs> For this section, we'll focus on our three main protagonists and Calamity Raven, along with the overall themes. I won't go into every other detail with the Nameless as you guys should probably experience that for yourselves. That and, well, there isn't too much depth to go into. Might make a top 10 list at the very least to make up for that. So let's start where I left off with our main hero, Kurt Irving. Kurt is pretty much the ideal soldier that the Academy and Gallia wants. Serious about his job, calm on the field, and even focused on getting the mission done. But he isn't quite skilled regarding social skills, which does lead to him ignoring some things about his squad that seem, well, pretty damn obvious. Plus, his anger can get the better of him, something he tries really hard to keep under control during the most stressful of situations. When that happens, he busts out a jar of candy to munch on. Man, his dental bills have to be the worst. The anger, though, does help humanize him. 
Such is showing his frustration at the situation of leaving Darkstens to die under orders from the Gallia troops, and not being able to do anything about it. In fact, a lot of this stuff is what makes him different from Gunther from the first game. Gunther was more lighthearted than Kurt, and it was understandable given his upbringing. Moreover, Gunther at times is much more effective at leading his forces, as seen in the forest when they first meet up. His knowledge of the land and bugs leads to more unorthodox tactics that Kurt would normally never think of. In fact, Kurt is not the only one who contributes to planning. Some of Kurt's victories were the result of his squad helping him out with new strategies, and that's especially important given his development is to care more about his squad. At the very least, show more that he does care, and isn't just someone spouting orders. Not to mention the fact that he can keep crazy criminals in line, along with an obsessed cop, does speak highly about his command. He shows no hesitation when going with plans his squad proposes, as he likes to improve his abilities. The best example for that outside of a certain quote after a battle is when he tries to create the best spice for his teammates, and ends up taking so long that it's the next day. Kurt Irving, the real smartest moron. <laughs> Bitch, you trying to cut in on my territory? At the same time, he wouldn't have formed those emotional bonds without the help of his team, especially the other main characters. That's where Gusser comes in, helping to be the person to raise morale in the Nameless while Kurt was mostly the brains. Though the balance on that is constantly shifting when Calamity Raven gets involved, and Galia's orders constantly putting Gusser on edge. Of course, his development would be pretty average without the other two heroines of the game, Rila and Nimka, and since his best moments come from them, I might as well bring them up. Rila helps serve as the biggest emotional support for him, and not just by having the most romantic or shippy scenes with him either. Her own problem in the game stemmed from people calling her the Angel of Death. This is because even in the most dangerous of missions, she survived but her teammates didn't. This was only bolstered when the last Captain of the Nameless died while on another mission, causing her to distance herself from her own teammates. In order to gain her loyalty, Kurt tried to help her with this problem, not believing in such rumors. Rila is also the one to usually help Kurt through the most stressful situations too like the one time he smashed a jar of candy when he ran out and couldn't think of a plan to escape their current predicament of being hunted down by Galia thanks to a traitor within wanting Kurt's team dead. In addition to seeing Kurt deal with failure and impossible odds, we see Rayla finally gain courage in utilizing her Valkyria powers for a change. It should be noted that the reason she hesitated was because of Salvaria already being seen as a monster, and the Nameless were already frightened enough when running into such an unstoppable force. Not to mention, people kind of fear what they don't understand. Like Calculus. Why is learning you important?" And by that point in the story, her team did start trusting her more. With no other place to go, of course she starts to view them as her own family, a place where she does belong. By losing that now thanks to her own abilities or because of her inaction, of course it scares her. Imagine the situation she puts herself in. People have distanced themselves from you due to the way you look, and the only other people who took you in have just died, leaving you pretty much alone. Now you need a job, there's a war breaking out, and squads have to work together, so might as well earn that cash and defend your home. Except every squad you are put in dies, you are suspected of not just pure bad luck, like the lucky charm the Grim Reaper wears, but also could be considered a traitor or something. Not to mention buried under bodies too at one point, a lot of doubt can quickly cloud the mind as you start believing that stuff. And just when it's finally going away, just when you are finally being accepted by others, some jerk-offs now decide to kill the same squad who you have taken bullets for, for a crime you did not commit. Yeah, Rayla's life kinda went to hell after her adopted parents died. That being said, that self-sacrifice attitude is also very damaging. Since she isn't as powerful as Salvaria or Alicia, she can only maintain the Valkyrian form for a short amount of time before collapsing. She gets weak enough to be taken down by Imka later. Plus, her emotions can easily get the better of her, sometimes not listening to other people and doing those self-sacrifices to prove her worth. It's after this point in the story that the characters genuinely show off their development. Kurt at this point in the story is far more caring about his teammates, hence the frustration he feels, while also giving a ton of concern for Rila's condition when it's revealed that the Valkyria form is actually hurting her. He even hates himself for relying on such a power that's clearly going to cause her pain. Yet Rila ultimately makes the choice to stand up for herself and use those abilities. She still worries about how others may feel a lot of the time, but the trust in Kurt helps to make sure she does stick around and help however she can. So while it does seem like Rila does rely a ton on Kurt, it goes the other way as well. He'd be dead without Rila and I really like that dynamic of how characters need each other, rather than it being one-sided. While she sometimes shows some fear of her abilities when hearing of Salvaria or Alicia, it's natural when she doesn't have a ton of time to reflect on all this. Hell, if it wasn't for her being assertive, it's doubtful Kurt would be the man he is now, regardless of the romance route. So while it seems like Rayla is your standard soft-hearted character, these events help show the level of strength and courage she possesses, and makes her a far more interesting character than Alicia in my eyes. Not to mention, she used her abilities more compared to Alicia, it didn't even matter what Kurt said about not relying on such power due to the trust they built. 
Compare this to the original, where Alicia did do some fierce damage to the Marmota, and then just went for the suicide bomb and never used her abilities ever again. Not even at the final battle with Maximilian. So yeah, while Alicia is no doubt far stronger, possibly smarter than Rayla, Rayla came off as a better character due to her willingness to use her abilities and how her relationship with Kurt built up over time. Hell, even if you don't romance her, she still values the friendship she had with Kurt and wishes him and Imka the best. Rayla possesses a lot of qualities that make her a great hero. Yeah, she has fan service traits, but the game never really drew that much attention to them. Sometimes. Well, to be fair, her Valkyria form in the DLC is this. Yeah. Although, to be fair, it still looks better than the 2 form, which is this. Seriously, put some pants on that kid. Imka is the final main heroic character, and easily the roughest around the edges due to her intense training and the trauma surrounding her. As I mentioned in my Salvaria video, Salvaria destroyed Imka's village during an awakening, leaving Imka a lone survivor, and extremely fearful of the Valkyria form. So fearful she nearly kills Rila when she transforms, blinded by pure rage and fear. She is also the least helpful of the group at first, relying only on herself, which could easily disrupt or ruin a strategy Kurt has. The only way he could get her to work with the others was to make a promise to kill Salvaria. Though as I already explained, that did not end well at all, with her caving into fear in round one and getting utterly destroyed in round two. As a result of the tragedy of losing her home, Imka is more isolated than Rila, not really interacting with anyone else as she just doesn't care. One of the closest things we get is her acknowledging Annika as someone of a rival after Annika wouldn't leave her alone. She's so single-minded in her goals that she only admires those that could help her achieve them. It's one of the reasons she does like Kurt a lot, as they sometimes compete, think practically, and with him being one of the first people to openly accept her, she does eventually harbor feelings for him. By trying to get her to open up more, he ultimately helped bring hope back into her life. The real turning point was after the death of Salvaria. This was because after she found out the purpose in her life was pretty much gone, she, well, she tried to commit suicide in order to keep pursuing Salvaria in hell. Well, I'd say that went dark real quick, but we were already kinda there. Anyway, it's only with Kurt offering himself to die that Imka eventually does stop herself from going through with it, since she of course doesn't want to be responsible for losing the only person who, well, really cared about her. It's through her ending that we can really see the huge impact Rila made on Kurt, as he is the optimistic and friendly one compared to Imka, being the kind of person she needs right at that very moment. Her interactions with Rila are few, but there is enough to genuinely help make their friendship seem genuine, and they are both bonded by their own struggles. This was seen after Imka attacked Rila in a rage, triggered by Rila's transformation, and nearly killed her until Kurt stepped in. Imka was genuinely ashamed and remorseful after that stunt, though the two did eventually patch things up. I just wish there was more of that. There seems to be a DLC scenario that helps explain some more, but that's sadly not translated. Even then, I think it's just Rila getting jealous of Imka or something. Speaking of, Imka is less tolerant with not being chosen as Kurt's girlfriend, but the ending still helps shows her quite happy, taking the time to respect his decision and wish them happiness, even giving them Gusurg's old tank. Actually, the endings are very reflective of each character. With Rila, she considers being in the squad like being with her family, so the fact that the epilogue focused so heavily on the other soldiers is extremely fitting. I mean, Rila has plenty of time to make her affection for Kurt very obvious to see. Imka, on the other hand, is far more isolated as there isn't even a wedding, and it's all about her and Kurt, which is fitting as she doesn't have a whole lot of people she really cares about like Kurt. Plus, this one actually does expand more on the relationship as well, to help make up for the lack of that scene throughout the story. At the same time, this also shows her to help orphan children, people like her who grew up with the idea of revenge and make sure they lived a happy life. It's definitely a bit weird to see the woman I used to destroy legions of troops suddenly like this, but I think it's well deserved given all the bullcrap she had to endure. As for which romance I preferred, I honestly preferred Rayla's. I think it flows better with those that enjoy not just the other nameless members, but enjoy the chemistry Rayla and Kurt showed throughout the entire game. Now, that's not to say I don't like Imkus. On the contrary, I love that one as well. A bit more isolated, sure, but it does help make up for the lack of development she had with Kurt in some areas, and helped her recover from just being someone who craved vengeance. It's good that they got their own endings and are happy with the choices they made. Plus, Imkas does give us some insight on what they're doing in the future, while Rayla is definitely more in the moment kind of deal. As far as I know, there isn't a canon ending, so you can freely enjoy either one. The only disappointment I could see from people is the lack of a romance between Gusurg and Kurt. Although, then again, that's what fan fiction is for. And fan art. Pretty much a lot of things fans can do. Speaking of him, Gusurg in particular cares about one thing his independence, to be free from the persecution the Darksons suffer at the hands of both Gallia and the Imperials. Initially, he is very friendly to Kurt, 
and manages to help out the squad since he knows that they are good people who treat him normally. Had the likes of Dahao never showed up, or if Galia hadn't had a bunch of racists, or people willing to hide or use chemical weapons, he might have stayed with Kurt's army. Outside of those reasons, there would have been no reason to stay given how much he values his comrades. But those things did happen, and to see the man he called Bren let it happen due to orders does kind of tick him off, even if Kurt is showing how much he hates making that call too. Without his comrades are willing to openly bow down to Galia and their otherwise bad decisions, and with no choice on their end either, he does the only thing he can do, join Calamity Raven. And at this point, it's a completely understandable situation given what I just mentioned did happen. What choice would you pick? Sticking with an army that, while well, has your friends, they can't help you as the main army will throw you to a pack of wolves to save their own skin while labeling you as a war criminal? Or will you choose someone who embodies all of your ideals, and willing to treat you with respect, and with allies more than willing to aid you? Okay, Lydia kinda gets in the way of that, but the point still stands. It's a choice between constantly living in a nightmare with very little hope, or achieving a dream you always wanted. And he has no problem accepting the fact that he will be the executor of the Nameless. While he was unwilling to bear the sins for Galia since they hate him, he's more than willing to do such a horrible act for Tahao, desperately wanting to make that dream a reality. He also knows Kurt far too much to simply go easy on him, and doesn't hold back. And yet there's this weird bit of respect between each other, as they do meet on the battlefield briefly without shooting one another, and Gusurg dying in Kurt's arms. That respect is further shown when Kurt manages to make sure Gusurg gets his own funeral. Sad and depressed, things ended like this. Finally, there's Dahao, the main villain of the game, and the one who sees himself as the hero of the Darksons, as he is willing to fight for their independence. At the same time, it's kinda hard to argue with that as he is the only person doing something about the situation, since at this point, the Queen had not revealed herself as a Darkson. Dahao had initially been playing both the side of Maximilian to crush Gallia, and with Borgia to help extend the war, all with the promise of a nation that would be independent of Gallia and the Empire. Should one fail, he'd gain the favor of the other, after all. And given the Empire's absurdly harsh conditions in the mines where they can easily die, it's easier to see why many of those Darksons would join to Howe's cause. That level of desperation and the need of a hero can easily make this guy stand out. Plus, his personality is very enjoyable. And aside from his appearance in the middle of this ominous shot, his charm is very easy to see. The only thing that really makes him look evil in the game is commanding his troops, all of whom are dressed with skulls on their faces, or something that looks like a skull making them look like servants of death itself. After all, everyone labeled the Darksons as monsters, so embracing that worked wonders. Although it should be noted Lydia came up with the name, and Borgia was the one to form the group to use them for their own purposes, so it's likely to how didn't really have much of a say in the design of the outfits. Much like Kurt, he is someone who did seek improvement, and thus never really badmouth people like Gregor, someone who everyone in Calamity Raven does hate due to his treatment of Darksons as seen in the first game. The reason he doesn't show such dismissal is because he would be unable to judge himself for his own actions. It's likely one of the reasons he lets the Nemus live in a few rare instances, as he fully admits he is impressed with their progress. That and trying to convince Darksons like Imka and Gusurk to fight for his cause and not Galia's. It actually does help maintain a level head, even when he finally snaps later in the game. At the same time, he too is vulnerable. In fact, he's only doing this because of his dead wife. By the time Gusurk sacrifices himself to try and destroy Galia through a method Dahao just didn't want to go with due to his honor, Dahao recognizes the evil he is committing, and truly succumbs to it by using the weapon Borgia kept hidden. Which in this case was an ancient Valkyrian weapon that could blow up nations quite quickly. Might as well be a freaking nuke without the nuclear energy. These factors do help make him a pretty damn good villain, supplemented with what the game shows how the Darksons are mistreated, along with Gusurk's own struggles with Galia. His passion is actually so strong, he cannot die. No, I'm not meaning that like some kind of metaphor or anything like that. He literally cannot die. Well, at least during the finale of the game anyway. He will eat every bullet, rocket, and so much more. As you can imagine, this made me have to take a few gambles during the battle with him. Thankfully, the objective wasn't to kill him, so I could win. But holy shit did certain moves he made during the battle make me sweat like crazy. It's only when he meets his wife again while he slowly dies does he finally stop. It's one of the few things to help show that he wasn't a true monster, but instead forced into this due to both Galia and the Empire being dicks to the Darksons. In the end, Dahao had a goal in mind, and was a hero to the people until he turned mad. Imka, though, describes it best after Gusurg dies, saying how this was no better than her thirst for vengeance. Besides, every villain can be seen as the hero of their own story in their own mind. That being said, the game doesn't frame this as badly as, say, Bioshock Infinite did with two certain characters. I fully acknowledge the house goals, and it sucks that things had to turn out this way. That being said, glad no one can use the damn Valkyria nuke thingy. Now, as for another overall theme I can think of the game, it's this. Faith. Every major character is doing something out of faith for their commander or comrades, 
Both the main hero and villain are capable of changing people by placing faith in them, and vice versa. At the same time, there are people in those armies willing to go above and beyond the duty for them to make sure their plan succeeded. We see this with Rayla, who volunteered to go into a minefield to help the team when no one else would, though it seemed Kurt was going to offer to do it himself. And later, we see Gusurk do the same, willing to be branded a war criminal for Tahao's sake by destroying Galia. Tahao, in turn, had believed in his dream so much, he could not die in the final battle until the team was finished trying to make sure his bomb could not go off, finally falling. Zig willingly sacrificed his life before the game's finale to stall the Nameless as well, just to make sure Tahao's dream was realized. Even Lydia put her faith in Gusurg when she had nothing left. Plus, there was Imka's putting faith in Kurt to help her achieve his mission, or Rila using her Valkyria powers despite the negative effects. Taking Gusurg as an example again, in a letter he wrote to his sister, he fully admits that his respect and faith in Kurt led him to take this path as well, to give him the strength needed to achieve his goal too. The story also shows how others needed faith in something to keep going, and how they are willing to die for what they believe in. We saw that Imka needed that, but citizens too counted on the faith of Borgia to save them. Much like how people today place so much faith in religion, sometimes even becoming fanatics. Silvaria can be seen with this as well despite not being a major player like Tahao, after her battle with Imka. Even the protagonist of the second game to an extent can be seen with this as well, given what happened over the course of the game, with people like Colette not forgetting the help the Nameless gave them while Galleon forces sat on their asses. Much like any other emotion, faith too can be used as a weapon, or to help save others and give them the courage to live on. And that's why I really like this game. It's similar to why I like Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne, these characters are not just put in a damn near hopeless situation, situations that, well, deviate from the norm of video games, but they all pull together and triumph against all odds. Similar to how I like the dynamic of couples that help each other, I like heroes that can rely on others rather than rely on some deus ex machina or power that's saved for the very end. I'm looking at you, Personas 3-5. through 5. I'll talk more about that when I review those games. And considering how everyone are outcasts, thrown into the situation despite not doing anything to deserve it, most of them anyway, I do feel like I have a stronger connection to this game, similar to how I feel about Homer of Sendering Kagura. It's all this stuff that helps Valkyria Chronicles not just be a good game, but one of my favorite games of all time. So overall, how does Valkyria Chronicles 3 manage to hold up? Well, honestly, I still friggin' love this game, even after a second time playing it. I love you so much. It's a real damn shame we never got this translated. This game improves marvelously over the second game in a ton of aspects, making it easier to upgrade your forces. Unfortunately, it carries some of the same problems such as repeated environments, and it can also take a long ass time to grind your soldiers into their elite status. You may even need a guide to figure out how the flying hell they use and gain these other potentials. Believe me, if these elements are turning you away from the game, I can understand. Unless grinding is why I can't get into the Disgaea series after all. And yet despite those problems, each battle feels really damn good to play. Even if the AI is dumb sometimes, they have enough firepower to remain a legitimate threat. And the abilities of the main characters in the game also feel good to pull off, added with the great music too. The story is honestly the best in the series for me. I really don't mean to badmouth the original's plot, but this game simply had more intriguing main characters, a better romance with both Imka and Rila for Kurt, actual plots for the side characters, and best of all, really damn good main villains that make Maximilian just look pathetic. The first game was and still is pretty okay, and still has a few advantages over Game 3, especially the visuals, but that's to be expected given the different platforms. Plus, I can still recommend the original and encourage everyone to take part in this series. Not to mention, it's surprising how good of a job they did without making Kurt's team seem like a bunch of Mary Sues, or horribly contradicting the other games. It's a damn long game with a satisfying ending that always makes me smile. And if anyone at Sega is listening, know that I would buy any edition of this game the moment it was announced so long as we have everything translated. While the art book tells us what happens in those scenarios, I'd rather see them for myself how they play out. I'm the smartest moron, and it's been a good three years, guys. Even if I'm not the most successful, it's been a good run. But do not think this is me disappearing forever. I'll be back eventually. I just need to get my life in order, I need to get a job, I need to sort everything before I go nuts. So that way I can focus more on the reviews. 
So until then, I'll see you guys next time on The Smartest Moron.